Hello, welcome to the University of Northampton Popular Music Podcast number 6, October 2023. And today we see a return of Michael Bell. Hello Stace, how have you been my friend? Not too bad, been very, very busy. It's been very exciting. September was a super exciting month. We had the Northampton Music Festival, which was went down really well. And we also... Um, two nights ago, three nights ago, we did our Welcome Week gig with the fabulous One Way Ticket, who are um, one of the one of our bands at the uni, and also an open mic night. And so many of our new music students got up and performed, and they're already amazing. So it's exciting times ahead. So I'm very, very tired and very excited. How about you? What have you been up to? Me, loads of stuff. I mean, I suppose similar to you, um, it was very good, the open mic night um, and the festival. Um, really good to see some new enthusiasm coming into the university. Thank you for all your help and support. It was really, really good. Um, outside of that, I've been, of course, starting my um, postgrad studies. So looking a lot into 3D sound and kind of modelling stages um, outside of my door, which has been a lot of fun, it must be said. And of course, the ever important reading of books and understanding the context behind what I'm up to. So today, um, we thought we'd talk about a really important uh, topic. Uh, Michael and I both went to, and were lucky enough to be invited to go to um, a James online um, talk or event. Um, on I think it was on the 13th of September, is that right? That sounds about right, yeah. Um, and it's called, Why is Metadata Important? And um, it's basically about how creative musicians get paid and it's something Michael knows quite a lot about is that right Michael yeah so I mean it's one of the I think it's one of the sides of the industry that in a way gets neglected because it can get quite bogged down in detail but essentially artists and musicians do need to understand how their royalties um, and how their various roles even in an engineer sort of um, studio capacity attract and I think in the creative space in the studio so to speak it can be quite um easy to forget what responsibilities and roles people had so what tends to happen is musicians go into the studio they'll record a song Mm. then maybe a month later when it gets into the you know the business side of the world yeah people have forgotten you know what role happened who was who was kind of responsible for what Um, and it can sort of cause um a little bit of contention for creatives right um so it's really important for musicians to to mm. kind of get their, what we call metadata now. Okay. This used to be, I suppose, done on an actual piece of paper. Sure. Whereas now in the, in the ever in the ever evolving digital world, yeah. um, a lot of this can be recorded in a digital fashion. Okay, so I think that's great. And that's what we're going to talk about. But I think before we plough into this, the detail of this complicated area, I think we should just, for, for the sake of our viewers, let, let's try to give a context for, for what this is. So essentially, um, what what we're talking, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, we we basically operate within a syst- capitalist system, um, and as artists, so called artists and cre- or creative people, we create commodities, and those commodities belong to us, and we need to get paid for those commodities, and it. Interesting. I, I I heard an interesting podcast recently about uh, Charles Dickens, and you might think, well, what what on earth has Charles Dickens got to do with uh, music? <laughs> with music, yeah. But Charles apparently Charles Dickens was very very popular in America, right? More popular than in Britain, and and he so he decided to go on a big trip to America, um, partly because he was just going to get um, he was invited to give lectures and and people were going to love him. And also, he was really annoyed that in America, he wasn't getting any copyright for his books. Right. So he went over there to tell the Americans what for to start paying him copyright. Right. So it, had to, it almost had yeah. a business agenda for him going, in a sense. Uh, yeah, partly, partly. And apparently he came back very dis- very um, despondent about America. <laughs> and then he, he started writing books, which were a bit anti-American. And then the Americans went off of him, apparently. But... um. But the point is, America did eventually start paying copyright. So these copyright laws have evolved over time. And, and what we have now in place is 
uh, well, in international capitalism, which I suppose is the um, America hegemonic world, which Britain is, of course, part of, and the European Union is part of it as well, Australia, New Zealand, and some parts of Asia, like Japan is fully part of it. Mm-hmm. So Japan is West, Western in the sense of its institutions. Mm-hmm. Uh, so obviously it's not Western culturally. Uh, South Korea. So we're talking about this world where we we recognise that um, creative people make things and that that's, they have ownership of it. Correct. And if it's um, played or performed, that person should get some remuneration mm-hmm. for that. It's, their, it's your product. So as, as soon as you as an artist write a song, say, let's say, just keep it simple for now, you're, you're a sing-songwriter and you've written this, all the music and all the lyrics um, and, you, and you record it in some way. Let's say you write it down on a bit of paper. You write down the chords and the lyrics. That is your song. You own that song mm-hmm. and that's your copyright. Well, yeah, you, I mean, you could copyright just that page. Yeah. In terms of in terms of like, the Performing Rights Society or PRS, yeah, um, that that could definitely be um, that's your composition, and even the lyric side of that as well mm-hmm. can be copyrighted um, quite easily. And, and we're we're quite lucky in the UK in terms of our um, the UK law, so to speak, heavily favours creatives, mm-hmm. um, which I think is a, a great thing. To, to backtrack slightly um, with you speaking about America and how royalties are dealt with there, mm-hmm. I mean this this is even coming into the cinema world. There was a huge disagreement um among composers and theatres mm-hmm. where composers wanted royalties for their performance of their scores in the cinemas um, and ultimately that that didn't happen um, so any film that's played in the states mm-hmm. you, or in cinema in general you don't get uh, royalties but i suppose that is compensated with the sync fee yes you get your sync fees and of course as a composer you you've got your album that's released which you'll then receive royalties from um so coming back to, I suppose, the recording artist, it is definitely a, I think it was a, a huge problem in terms of how we collect a lot of this data. I remember back, what, 2019, sort of just pre-pandemic, spending quite a lot of time trying to work out how to get music for my artists into China and South America. Um, and at that time, you had to go through a different distributor called RootNote. And it just became so complicated in how this was be, all being tracked. You ended up with multiple distributors almost by territory. That's now changed, and a lot of that's opening up now. So even through like Distro Kids, say, or or CD Baby, you can get into those those realms. All right. So 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 okay. So remind ourselves, creative people, artists have um, ownership. They have the copyright of their song, mm-hmm. but it, it starts to get complicated. A, if a band writes a song together, let's say we're in a me and you're in a band, and I come up with the lyrics, you come up with the chords. And then it's um, a Bell Constantino song, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but we've got a drummer in the band and a bass player. Mm-hmm. And the bass players come up with the bass line. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. this is where arguments can happen. Yeah, well, Because the bass player can say, well, that's my unique bass line. And I might say, yeah, but to be honest, you could have any bass line. And my, my lyrics are so good. And then you get these conflicts within a band. But let's say it's harmonious. Let's say the whole band owns the copyright. Mm-hmm. That's straightforward. So there's four names on the copyright now, so if it's a four-piece band. Well, that's, I mean, I suppose it depends how you want to go about it. I know with something like Coldplay, for instance, mm. um, all the songs, that he essentially hires the musicians. So all the songs are written yeah. and, yeah. and record. He's the sole copyright owner and mm-hmm. songwriter for all the lyrics. And then they're paid, yeah, they're paid yeah. huge salaries. But how I would, would you're correct. If someone's, if someone's performing drums, say... Mm or as you say, even like a, like a bass line to, to the track you've specifically written, mm-hmm. I think there needs to almost be then a, a, an almost sort of democratic conversation within the band. Mm-hmm. If it's a four-piece, are we just going to split it 25% each? Mm. You know, or are we going to leave a specific percentage? Are we going to bring the producer in or mm-hmm. the recording engineer in? That's sometimes mm-hmm. a conversation where mm-hmm. bands perhaps don't have the, the capital up front to pay for the production. No. So they sacrifice some of their royalties on the recording. Or indeed of the of the performance. Right. Let's let's backtrack again a bit. Sorry. Um. So, so but essentially, we're talking about two things. We're talking about commodity. Mm-hmm. So Coldplay, he's creating commodities because mm-hmm. every time that um song that he's written gets played, he gets money. So it's what we call passive income. Mm-hmm. Whereas the performers have been paid a fee to be in a place at a time 
doing something mm -hmm. and they got their fee, mm -hmm. which might be a lot of money. Yeah, it is. I imagine it is. It is a lot of money, but that's it. Yeah. So they haven't got a commodity. So, so they don't own an asset. They do not own an asset. He right. owns the assets. Correct. Okay. So this, so this is where um, I think we bring we bring in the James conversation about metadata, because it's the same with sound engineer. So you know, a sound engineer <clears throat> may have um, shaped the sound of, of a hit record that everyone knows and loves, mm -hmm. and potentially has got no asset at all. They they did that job in a studio. They got paid. Sound engineers got nothing potentially. Well, unless through the through the PPL, when we talk about the the recording of the song. Okay. So so let's talk about let's talk about mechanical. So we've talked about copyright, which is the ownership of the commodity of the song, but there's also the mechanical right, which is the ownership of the physical, which isn't physical anymore, but it used to be a physical CD or a vinyl. Well, we still we still do have those, but. It's mostly streaming. So the the physical the master it's called the master. Mm -hmm. It's the master recording. Mm -hmm. So it's the ownership of that and that, how that gets divvied up. And that in that in itself is another asset. So that's another commodity. Yeah. So this is your second half of a recording. Mm -hmm. And you know I find a lot of you know say freelance engineers mm -hmm. that they, they need to get on there as as on the PPL as a as a um, a creative um, collaborator. You know, or, or, or a creative asset to the to the recording, mm -hmm. in which case they're then entitled to royalties through the PPL. Um, so it's a, there's a whole conversation around mm. how that works. I think you're right in saying that obviously we've moved into a digital realm, mm -hmm. but we do still use the, you know, mechanicals is still a term which is very much used in the, within mm -hmm. the industry. So mm -hmm. there are various ways of of going about this now. I mean, you can. One way an artist can get around kind of almost being their own self-producing artist without having to have mm. a publisher yeah. is to partner with a third-party publisher. Okay. So one company that will do that is a company called Song Trust, and this gets into mm. royalty administration. So they'll take about a 15% cut, mm. but you register the song with them, and then they'll collect your royalties globally. Okay. So they then are almost in control. So you'll see on your royalty statement mm. things coming through the BMI, ASCAP, um, from Greece okay. or from or from all right what, you know what's the BMI what's ASCAP uh, so yeah BMI and ASCAP are the American um, PRS so what, what's PRS Performing Rights Society and what does Performing Rights Society do Performing Rights Society is the UK um, equivalent of say ASCAP so they will collect royalties whenever your song is performed so say it's played on the radio yeah. or you're out on stage at a venue mm -hmm. which is why you need to make sure that your set lists are yeah. also submitted to the venues that you're playing mm -hmm you're due a royalty for this for, the, for your piece of music being performed. Okay. So that's on that would be Stace. You've composed mm -hmm. chords, lyrics. That's on that side that's of it. That's my song. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Correct. So depending on how that's split. Mm -hmm. So in the Coldplay case, mm -hmm. he'd just be receiving one hundred percent, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you had the four piece example mm -hmm. and you split it twenty five percent, twenty five percent would be coming to each yeah. member of the band. Okay. Um, <clears throat> But then, then we get into this complicated area of metadata, mm -hmm. which is the bits of code that go onto a song. That's digi once the song's digitized, so so the tradition, so the music industry before digitization, say, was selling units. So mm -hmm. a unit was say a record, a vinyl, or a cassette, or what something like this. So you know you'd sell X number of units. Mm -hmm. And then record shops would um, register how many, say, um, I don't know, I Hate Monday songs that they've sold. Mm -hmm. That would get all added up, and whoever sold the most was number one. Mm -hmm. and that's so then you get the charts and, and all that. Yeah. Today, all that, in reality, all that's kind of gone, hasn't it? Well, it's, it's complicated because you now it's now done by... So to, to, to get the equivalent of, um, of one unit sale... You need to have around 1,500 streams on Apple Music. On Spotify Apple Music, sorry, less. Okay. Um, so Yeah, so it, the different streaming services have different... Different rates, yeah, yeah different, different rates. rates. But okay. it's when you get into the, you know, I mean, some, you know, in some of my lectures, we look into some of this nitty gritty and mm -hmm. it really is a 0.0000325 cents right. per stream, mm -hmm. depending, on, depending on how it was played as well. So say, for instance, mm -hmm. the free version of Spotify, mm -hmm. because you can't actually choose a song you must shuffle the album. That's deemed as you haven't chosen to play the song. 
and therefore there's a diminished royalty return to the artist mm. because it's almost like um, a radio station in a sense within Spotify. It's treated like a broadcast but paid at a vastly less fee. Yeah. So the okay. So the so the contention around this is the argument from the disgruntled artist is that they're being ripped off by um, the uh, dis, um, so let's what the streaming platforms, yeah, yeah. whatever they might be. Um, <clears throat> but the argument from like pragmatic ma music management types is exposure because of exp well exposure is one thing, but also um, if someone buys a unit, if someone buys your CD, then they pay for it once and that's it. Whereas if they're streaming, there's lot you've got lots of income mm -hmm. coming in. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the argument for and against that. I think generally it, speaking, it is. But I think that's kind of wrapped in. Mm. It, you'd need to be, you know, a Rihanna or Eminem or a big a big name, I big think, name. for that to actually make sense. I mean, there's a place, in my opinion, there's a place for it for sort of independent musicians. You know, there's that whole I try to go on the model now that if you're if you if you've got a thousand fans that spend a hundred pounds a year on you. It's a pretty good income, mm -hmm. um, but that's relying on you selling tickets to your gigs, then buying your merchandise, perhaps selling through a more independent company such as Bandcamp, yeah. and pressing a CD. Because you've got to look at it that you know if I if I produce an album and say I sell I sold that independently and I got eight pounds for that album, yeah. Say someone played it and they thought it was okay, but it wasn't necessarily like their their top ten record, right? Mm -hmm. I've still got my eight pounds. Mm. Whereas someone might play my album once on Spotify, mm. they're not necessarily going to play it 1,500 times to get that equivalent rate. So this is my kind of argument in terms of how mm. it can be beneficial to you, mm. but you need the, the big marketing around it to do that. But I would say just a slight going back in time, mm. this isn't a new thing. I mean, you know, when, when say Michael Jackson was out, you know, mm. a new Michael Jackson release. Mm -hmm. There'd be a massive great cardboard cutout of, of him mm. in all the record stores and the shelves would just be full of Michael Jackson's new record. Yeah. So the industry almost pushed yeah. consumers into buying that product mm -hmm. by removing other choice or at least diminishing other choice for a period of time. Mm. So that's a contentious side of the industry as well. Mm. Mm. Okay. And, and, all, all, and that was touched on in the James talk. It was, yeah. Um, what we'll do is we'll link to the James. James have now published their um, event online, so you can go and have a listen to it. And it talks about this sort of stuff in quite quite deep detail. So if it's something you're more interested in, go and listen to the James talk and um, follow through the links down below in this um, podcast. But let's briefly touch on metadata so people have got a bit of a handle. On, and if they want more info, they can go and listen to the James talk. Sure. Sure. Tell, tell me about what is metadata then. So metadata is essentially um, if you just a, a piece of a piece of uh, like a string of words or a string of numbers that identifies a track. So you could have what's called an ISRC code, uh -huh. which identifies a song, and it's a globally recognised standard for international that. standard In, recording. That's code. the one. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and that will whenever you release music, even independently through something like DistroKid. They will generate this code for you, mm -hmm. or you mm -hmm. can do it independently. You can mm -hmm. generate it through the people. So you, you create an MP3, say. Does that metadata get printed into the MP3 somehow? So it used to be part of the mastering process was that we'd, we'd almost embed yeah. a code sort of outside the audible yeah. hearing range yeah. in, in yeah. the track. Mm -hmm. It's not something you need to do now because right. your distributor will do that for you when you upload the track. But, but it does happen. I believe it is still a case it's because still physically yeah, because sort of how, happens in, yeah. Because you can get things like TuneSat. Say you've released your your music into sync. Yeah. Um, and then you know, I mean, I've heard my music on sort of a Discovery mm. Plus. Mm. Like, hang on a minute, am I being, am I being paid for this? Mm. So TuneSat, you can upload your track to them, mm -hmm. and they scan all the networks yeah. and pick up snippets of your track there. Mm -hmm. So that's got to be a way that they're still identifying that track through yeah. their listeners. Yeah. Um. So that that side of it was sort of the last part of mastering. Yeah, um, sure. But even that's become a lot more simplified in a sense, which is a good thing in terms of perhaps you don't necessarily have to think about it as much as you previously did. No. But the knowledge of it, it you know, mm. because of, because they're kind of doing it for you, mm -hmm. the knowledge of it is sort of going a little bit out of the window and not mm. perhaps being as prominent no. uh, with that. Um, but metadata as a, as a broader term, you know, mm. I mean, you can... 
within a recording now. They're even talking within the James uh, discussion mm -hmm. about even uh, recording things such as what guitar strings were used. Sure. Or what cabinet, say a Marshall cabinet or an orange cabinet. Okay. Which might be helpful for bands for endorsements or for... It might be a conversation in terms of what, oh, other, uh, what other royalties mm -hmm. can we perhaps accrue. Sure. So, yeah. So metadata is essentially some... It's informa digital information embedded in the song that, that allows the creator to um, be acknowledged as the creator of that commodity and get paid. Yeah, but this on I mean, a digital level. Yeah, in terms of that, I mean, there's there's lots of metadata that can get attributed to a track, and this is one thing mm -hmm. the argument sort of pro streaming. Oh, mm -hmm. Whereas before, say for instance, um, someone from the from the PRS say would go into a gym, you know, mm. and they go into a pub and they'd sit there for a couple of hours mm -hmm. and they'd note down the the kind of genre of music that was being played in that venue, mm -hmm. which then got reported back and artists got paid out of a generalized pool. Right. That doesn't seem very accurate to me. Whereas now you could say that if a if a if a venue is correctly use um you know say using Spotify or Apple Music, mm -hmm. because it's all tagged and it's all the metadata's in the track, mm -hmm. you can perhaps track a lot with a lot more clarity what is actually being played. Isn't that what I just said? Pretty much. Oh, okay. <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much. I just me delving into too much detail as okay. usual, Stace. Cheers. Well, thank you very much for joining me today, Michael. Um, look forward to having more conversations with you and if you've got to the end of this podcast and you, you want to know more about this subject then go and have a listen to the James event which is now published on YouTube thanks for listening everyone thank you very much don't forget to like and subscribe cheers cheers see you soon